Deuteronomy chapter number eight, and uh, as much monitor as you would be so gracious to share, we'll appreciate. Deuteronomy chapter number eight. Deuteronomy chapter number eight. Um, this past week and. I was at, I was telling them on my social media story that I was at the Millennium Mall and I saw, oh, there's the button. I saw this in front of me, this young man almost get thrown off a balcony. Um, and I thought, day that we live, you just never know what can happen if you're just minding your own business. This man, I saw him literally fly over the rail, hold on by one arm while everybody's screaming, no, no. He flips back over the rail and then these two groups start fighting in the middle of the mall. And it's crazy because there's a lot of things that happen that you'll never hear on the news. Like people who are on I drive, like, you know, you think like that's an absolutely safe place and it gives you this sense of like, there's no trouble, there's no drama. And then you talk to people who work at the space and you're like, they're like, no, it's not a safe place. That's why you see a lot of young ladies getting trafficked and things like that. So even during the holidays, you gotta be equally cautious on where you place your feet. So you just, just got to be a, a, aware of your surroundings. And it's critically and highly important that you do that during the season. That you just are not naive. And if you're jumping in Ubers, making sure child locks are not there because they're utilizing that to traffic people. And if you are not aware, Orlando is the top three places for trafficking. And if you're not aware, the greatest place for trafficking happens by the Millennium Mall. You would never know that. And so that's why I encourage you just to be real vigilant and wise uh, because it's just the way the world is. Deuteronomy 8, we've been on Deuteronomy 6, Deuteronomy 7 for the last eight weeks, and we're going on Deuteronomy 8. Deuteronomy 8 is where we're going to be at, and I'm going to give you a few moments to get there. If you haven't found it, it is the fourth or fifth, it is the fifth book of the Bible oil, and I want you to utilize that in Deuteronomy chapter number eight. Deuteronomy chapter number eight. All right, it says, be careful to obey all the commands that I am giving you today. Then you will live and multiply. And you will enter and occupy the land the Lord swore to give your ancestors. It sounds like Deuteronomy six, but it's not. Remember how the Lord your God led you through the wilderness for these 40 years, humbling you and testing you to prove your character and to find out whether or not you would obey his commands. Yes, he humbled you by letting you go hungry and then feeding you with manna, a food previously unknown to you and your ancestors. He did it to teach you that people do not live by bread alone. Rather, we live by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. For all these 40 years, your clothes did not wear out when your feet didn't blister or swell. Think about it. Just as a parent disciplines a child, the Lord your God disciplines you for your own good. So obey the commands of the Lord your God by walking in his ways and fearing him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, flowing streams and pools of water with fountains and springs that gush out in the valleys and the hills. It is a land of wheat and barley, grapevines, fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil, and honey. It is a land where food is plentiful and nothing is lacking. It is a land where iron is as common as stone and copper is abundant in the hills when you have eaten your fill be sure to praise the Lord 
your God for the good land he has given you, but that is the time to be careful. Beware that in your plenty you do not forget the Lord your God and disobey his commands and regulations and decrees that I have given you today. For when you have become full and prosperous and have built homes to live in, when your flocks and herds have become very large and your silver and gold have multiplied along with everything else, be careful. Do not be proud at the time and forget the Lord your God who rescued you out of slavery. I want to talk for a moment, and we talked several weeks ago about discipline in the desert, decisions in the desert, but this morning I want to take some time and talk to you about this thought, devotion in the desert. In Deuteronomy chapter number 7, you see that it says that in this land there will be enemies that are on the land, and it lists seven enemies, and we've been talking about a few of them. Gerashites, you have Perizzites, you have Hivites, and then it has one group called the Amorites. The Amorites, they are an interesting group. Um, they are, first off, for those of you that may have not been here, I want to repeat this because it's worthy of repeating, that you may be wondering, if God is bringing me into the promised land, why would I have enemies? Isn't the promised land a place that I would just be able to relax and enjoy and be able to and just take it in? No. Because God knows when we get to a place where we don't have to fight, we stop growing. So God will bring us to a land where there is adversarial people there because he knows that is what's going to be the thing that causes us to grow and go forward. But you see in this book, there are the Amorites. The Amorites are a group that was found in Deuteronomy. They are the last remnants of giants who once lived on the earth. And in the book of Joshua, they are the enemies of the Israelites who, des who were destroyed by the general Joshua. The Amorites were warlike mountaineers. They are represented on Egyptian monuments with fair skins, light hair, blue eyes, Aquilian noses, and pointed beards. If the Amorites had played a part in the Latin text, the audience would probably understand them to be lover boys. But to the Hebrew audience, which the Old Testament is written, they would be considered talkers. Amorites are a subgroup of the pre-Israelite inhabitants occupying the land. The interesting thing about the Amorites were they were giants. And because they were giants, they used their size to intimidate people to not want to fight them. They were not necessarily going to fight you, but they utilized their ability to talk to make you in fear so you would not approach them. The Amorites were so strong and they were so muscular and they were so vascular that they were soaring above the heights and they were dangerous looking individuals and they did not need to fight you out the land. They just needed to talk you out the land. Because the Amorites were good at one thing and that was talking. There was someone who said something I thought was quite profound is that he said that the devil is very crafty and very clever. He can whisper to you in your own voice. And I thought that was so proficient because the reality is most of the fights that you and I fight is not about can God bring us in there. It is the voice in our head telling us why God cannot. It is the voice in our head telling us why God will not. And that's what the Amorites are. They are giants. They are giants and they talk and they talk. And if you don't talk back, you will get talked out of what God said to you. Notice this very importantly. Deuteronomy is a book that we have in our hands to hold. But when they were given Deuteronomy, they didn't have a book of the Bible. The Bible was written 350 years after Christ. They didn't have a book of the Bible. They were taught this. They were told this. And so that is why it's important for them to continue to say, do not forget. Remember what I said. Remember what I said. Because if you do not tell yourself what God said, the voices in your Amorite head will tell you what God said. They won't stop you from getting in the land. The Amorites will let you get in the land and talk you out of the place that you're in because they'll make you feel like the land that you're in, you're not in. Amorites are an interesting group. They are warlike. They are powerful, but they are not undefeated. God told the people in Deuteronomy through Moses that I want you to know that you will not win automatically but you will win through the product of obedience 
You will not win automatically, but you will win through obedience. And God says in verse number two, through Moses, he said, I led you in the desert where there was no alternative but to either trust him or murmur against him. The desert was different from the wilderness. The wilderness, they knew what they were going to eat. In Egypt, they knew God was going to feed me manna. God was going to do this. But in the desert, they did not know what was going to happen. They had to trust God for their food their clothing, and their security. The desert is the place that God shows us what's really in us. Because you can say you love God until you're in it. You can say you trust God until you're in it. The desert is where God proves what's really in your heart. The desert is the place where God shows us. Do we really trust him or do we trust in ourselves? The Lord disciplined Israel to make them trust in him for their food, their water, and their clothing, which is so interesting that God says, when you were in the wilderness, remember, I, I made sure that your clothes kept growing. I made sure that your shoes kept stretching. You didn't need to get anything done because I was supernaturally providing for you each and every step of the way. And you may be looking at that kind of crazy, but no, you shouldn't because how many of you know that your gas stretched a little further than what it should? The money that you had went a little further than what it should. You ever went to the store, bought all this stuff, and they rang it up, and you're like, hey, no way is that cheap. Your money ended up stretching further than what it should because God has a way of stretching things. The challenge of God stretching things is that when he stretches them, you don't realize they've been stretched. You ever have children and they wake up and they grow and they grow overnight and you don't even realize that they stretched in their sleep. They don't even realize they stretched in their sleep. It's when they start putting on their old attire, you start to recognize that something happened while you were sleeping. I didn't see it, but it was happening. And that's what God says. He says, I want you to know there are a lot of things happening that you don't see, but they're stretching right in front of your face. So he says... Now, in the wilderness, you depend upon God for the necessities of life. But he says, I want you to be careful because prosperity has the ability to conceal the need of God and for the dependence upon God. And sometimes the best way that God keeps us close to him is by not letting us get into a season of plenty because a season of plenty oftentimes turns our hearts from him. I am really never concerned about people's faith walk when they're struggling because struggle sometimes makes people stay closer to God than those who are prospering because prosperity sometimes makes people feel self-reliant, self-dependent. I don't need to go to church every week. I don't need all that. But when you did not have what you had, you were there as much as you could be. Why? Because you had a self-dependence upon God. But the more you get on your own, the more educated we get, the more degrees that we get, the more opportunities we get. We start to say, well, I used to fast, but I don't need to do that no more because I've graduated beyond there. And God is like, that is the trap because prosperity can make one self-dependent and don't think prosperity means that you have to be rich because prosperity for a lot of us is the ability to swipe your card and not wonder if it's going to decline and some of you a couple years ago weren't at that place you weren't, you weren't always at the place where you knew that your card would not decline. You weren't always at the place where you knew that, oh, this is going to be all right. You weren't always at the place and God's like, don't forget. Because I know y'all. Y'all start struggling and you were at every worship service that can be found. You breaking the doors down of the church to get in. But once I start taking care of you, I start to get second class treatment because you forget I am the Lord your God. He says, obedience is not just understanding, but it's a posture of the heart. In the desert, the Israelites had suddenly removed, God removed all familiar things that they needed to live. He removed everything that was familiar to them because he used the desert to train them. What school could not teach them, the desert will. And as they were launching, I was saying, what, what seminary will not teach you, the desert will. 
What marriage class will not teach you, the desert will. The desert is the place where God perfects in us all the things that he needs to get us better at. The desert is the place where God says, you know what, I ain't like that about you. I'm going to fix that in you. And I'm not going to let anybody fix it. I'm going to do it myself. I'm going to make you so frustrated that you're going to have no choice but either to change or continually resist me. But the more you resist me, the longer you stay in the desert. going to be a grown up in the desert 35 and supposed to be out of there at 20 but because you keep fighting God God says I ain't, I'm, I'm okay remember your arms are too short in the box with God so if you want to keep fighting God you're going to stay in that desert longer and longer and longer but here's a few points I want to leave you with so God wants to make sure that you have devotion in the desert that you are committed to him in the desert that means that I don't know how I'm going to make it but I'm trusting God on how it's going to end I don't know how it's going to end up I, I'm totally dependent upon God I'm going to do what I need to do but I'm going to trust God to do what I cannot do and that's very important because when you are in the desert it teaches you skills that you'll need in the future and the things that you're cursing now are things you're going to need tomorrow you're going to learn how to need to learn how to trust in God when everything isn't going the way that you plan. You're going to need to learn how to trust in God when everything isn't lining up the way that you thought they should. And you still be able to look at your circumstance and say, I've been through this before. I don't walk through this before. I have a young man that I'm mentoring in the real estate world and we have these investment properties that he manages for me and he called me and he said, Pastor D, I want to tell you something. I've been calling you about problems that I've been experiencing and I never seen you once trip about it. And he tried to quit the job. He said, this is too much for me. But I said, this is what you wanted. The desert is going to teach you how to run a business, not an educational class. You got to learn how to do it. You know, books are good and you need them. But it's another thing when you have the experience that your books didn't teach you. And I said, this is what the desert is teaching. So he called me yesterday. He said, you know, I'm so glad you didn't let me quit. I'm so glad you didn't let me quit. He said, man, I learned so much in this experience that I've never learned before. And he said, every time I called you, you're so calm about it. I said, because I've been through it before. See, what makes you panic, I'm used to. This is normal. This is not abnormal. And what the desert teaches you is some people are popping themselves to sleep, drinking themselves to sleep while you're going to bed because I've seen this before. And some of you don't have enough skin in the game. And so when life happens, you start freaking out. And God's like, if you would have just listened to me and went through the desert process, you wouldn't be concerned about this. When heaven and earth fail you, you wouldn't be concerned about it because you're sitting there saying, you know what, I haven't been through this before. Because there, there is a need to have devotion in the desert. You cannot love God when you're winning. You have to love him even in the desert. Because the desert is what makes your worship real. It's what makes the song real to you. It's what makes the lyrics real to you. It is what makes it way make a miracle. You can't sing that if you've never been through anything. And it's in the desert that you start realizing those words are not just words. They are real. You cannot be sick and God deliver you and a song about healing come on and you sit there not be able to sing to it because you have the experience that says I've been in the desert I've seen him heal I know him to be a healer and that is what gets you through the next season your anointing that you've been praying for is not going to come from a connection it's going to come from your suffering in the desert live in a world where we want to connect up no babe that's not that's not how it works because when when God when you get perfected in the desert the people that God needs to connect to you they'll come find you because you've been proof positive that you made it through some of us need to see some wounds that you made it through some of us need to see some scars you made it through and therefore we will invest in what we've seen you suffered in 
We don't pay gurus for their success. We pay them for their lessons they learn in failure. about a, a guy that came over for one of my properties and he, he was charging me a fee to do a work and he said um, it was this amount and I was like, you know, man, that sounds expensive. So I called Rob. I said, hey, is this a fair price because it was in Jacksonville. If it was in Orlando, I would have used Rob. And I said, uh, it, it, how much was it? He says, no. You, Pastor, he says, it may have been, they may have only been there for three minutes, but you're not paying them for the time they've been there. You're paying them for their experience. Did you hear what I just said? They were there for three minutes. I paid them a whole lot of money for three minutes. But I'm not paying them for the time they've been there. I'm paying them for the lessons they went through in the desert so they can get to that place. And a lot of you want to be paid without no desert experience. Number one. Number two. One is devotion in the desert. Number two, there is a danger in winning in the desert. Somebody asked me the other day, he said, what? He was, we were sitting there, lunch with this artist, whatever, and he said, well, what, what, what would be an advice that you would give somebody who's coming up, doing the work, the ministry? I said, well, in any form or any fashion, I would say this, um, be careful when you win, because winning makes you take your foot off the gas. There, there is a danger to winning in the desert because when you win in the desert, you stop pursuing like you were pursuing before you were stuck in the desert. There is a danger that when you get in the desert and you get out of the desert, you finally made it out of the desert, you're winning in the desert, that you do not, pers you do not pursue with the same tenacity that you were pursuing before. And we clothe all of these excuses with what I call holy clothing. Well, I'm not, I'm not going any further because, you know, I've just done a lot right now and and, and God has been good and you know look how many other people aren't doing it look at my cousin Billy he's coming over for Thanksgiving he's a drunk he's not gone any further in life but look at it no because when you start winning you stop pursuing because most people don't tell you winning gets bored and so when you keep you can't say that with a cowboy jersey on you don't know nothing about winning so so here's what happens so win, winning Winning, winning gets tiresome. Winning gets tiresome. So here's the thing. Very important. God tells us an antidote very carefully. He says this. When you're winning in the desert, be careful that you don't forget me. Because when you're winning, God is so... All right, here's, here's what I said before. The reward that God gives his children who are winning in the desert is he gives you more work. If you're not getting more work, there are two things. Either you didn't complete the task that you got before, or you're not listening because you're so busy celebrating your winning season. Because after you get into the season, God is already in your next season. He's not staying where you're staying. That is why he told him, don't pack your bags in the desert. Follow me as a cloud, because where you want to park, I'm just going to let you stay there for a season. I'm going to keep moving. So winning in the desert is a very important and it's a very critical phase because most organizations suffer because they're so satisfied with where they are that they never know there is another level. Number three, there must be a demonstration of dependence. There must be a demonstration of dependence. The, God wants us to demonstrate dependence. We need to demonstrate dependence. Not independence, but dependence. God wants us to demonstrate dependence hear what I said God sometimes will eliminate people in your life because you have become so dependent upon them that they've replaced God in your life God wants us to demonstrate a spirit of dependence 
where I am not leaning on my own ability, I am leaning on God's ability because I am not inter I am not independent, I am interdependent. So God says, I need you to understand that when you're in the desert, I want you to have a posture of dependence so that when you get to the promised land, you'll keep that same posture. That is what tithing is about. It is a demonstration of dependence. It is not to say that I've made this on my own. It is to say that, God, I'm demonstrating my dependence upon you. That at any moment, all of this money can go away and I could be stuck with nothing. I am demonstrating dependence. That is what worship is. Worship is a demonstration of dependence. It is to show God that it is not by myself that I've arrived at this place. It is by your grace and your grace alone. Number four, it is the ability to, to the desert is the ability to determine to submit to the uncomfortable. It is the ability to determine to submit to the uncomfortable. It is a determination to submit to the uncomfortable. If you cannot submit to the uncomfortable, you will never grow. You, you got guys, ladies, gentlemen, you have to have uncomfortable seasons. You, you will not grow if you just have prosperous seasons. You will not grow correctly if you just have prosperous seasons. You have to learn how to submit to uncomfortable seasons. Because uncomfortable seasons stretch you. They stretch you. They stretch you. You don't need a new you. You just need to stretch the you you got. You need to be around that supervisor that aggravates you. Because they're stretching you. You need to be around people that work your nerves because they're stretching you. You need to be around people that don't think like you because they're stretching you. You need to be around people that don't philosophize like you because they stretch you. If everybody in your crew is like you, you need a new one. Because you need people that stretch you. You need people that stretch you economically. You need people that stretch you in what you read. You need people that stretch your attitude. Because here's the thing. God would rather you fail in the desert than get in the promised land and get kicked out. You mad at people talking about you at this level? you really mad at people disliking you at this level then you need to stay in the desert because the desert will train you how to deal with people that don't need you or like you because you realize that they're not a part of your destiny the ones that God needs for you to have he'll connect you if he has to even if he has to bypass them good place it don't feel like it when you're in it but some of you dated desert people that's why you know now when you're dating someone this ain't the promised land because this tastes like desert this this ain't no because you have the ability to know but you would not know that unless you've been through the desert the desert is the place that trains you and teaches you so that you know better you do better the desert is the place. Some of us have been in the desert for so long that I know we make in the church that marriage is the end goal for everything. But for some of us who've been in the desert, we can say, like, I'm happy being single and I don't think I'm going to be married. And I know for some of you, like, oh my God, that ain't my confession of faith. And some of you mean it out of a good heart, but some of you mean it because you need someone to validate your existence. And a lot of times in our culture, in our generation, the wedding really isn't about your love. The wedding is a fulfillment of your emptiness and you rush to get to the altar just so you can tell everybody you made it and now you ain't even happy because you married the desert and now praying for the promised land. 
The reality of the matter is, is the desert is a teaching place. It teaches me what I like. It teaches me what I don't want to tolerate. It teaches me what I appreciate. You won't learn that in the promised land. Learn in the desert. The desert grows you. The desert gives you discernment. I done seen you. You're running game. I learned that in the desert. You wouldn't learn that in the promised land. You learn that in the desert. when you've been through enough desert experiences you can look at somebody who's in the desert and you can tell them you don't need to quit. Why? Because I've been there before. Walked through that before. It's a season. It's a scheduled assignment. You don't want to stretch. You want God to do all the work while you do nothing. You want God to bring you into the promised land while you ain't giving them nothing to give. You need to be stretched. I'm closing the last one is this. It says, verse number 10 around, he says, I want to give you the antidote how not to forget. He says, it's, it is possible to be in, it is possible to forget. It's possible to get forget, but he says, I want, I want to teach you how not to forget. And it's, it sounds very elementary, but it's very true. He says, every step that you get, verse, this is like verse number 10, he says, Deuteronomy chapter number 8, he says, listen, I want you to know how not to forget what I've been doing in your life. He says, the, the simple way to do it is that every, it's real simple, it's, it's not that complex. He's like, listen, when you have eaten, verse 10, when you, when you have eaten in your fill, when you have eaten your fill, when you have eaten your fill, be sure to praise the Lord your God for the good the land has given to you. That sounds kind of simple. It's not simple because we don't do it. He's like the way to prevent yourself from being self-dependent is in everything, praise the Lord. No, he didn't hear what I said. He said the way that you don't become self-reliant is after you get full, after you ate your turkey, your stuffing. For those of you who are vegans, we're praying for you this holiday season. It's going to be rough. It's going to be a rough one. I can tell some of you about the backslide. There. I, listen, I'm a vegan, just not today. Praise the Lord. That lettuce ain't going to do it. Hey, huh? All right, so, so this, is, this is what he says. He says, no, whenever you accomplish something, stop and praise him. No. Ain't nothing deep. He didn't say turn around seven times. He didn't say take a lap. He said whenever you get full and you realize that this is the work of God, you stop and praise me. That sounds, that sounds really deep for some of you, but some of you, when you get the paycheck on Friday and it hit your account, stop and praise me. It may not be the amount that you want, but it's better than what you had. So I don't want you to get into the spirit of complaining. And that's why I ask you, whenever you get something that you know you don't deserve, don't tell everybody about it. Stop! Right? So whether it is a weekly thing, a daily thing, because a praiser cannot be ungrateful. No, you, you see, you missed it. You think that when I said praise him for the bank account, some of y'all were excited. But that's not what he told you. Remember, he says he's doing things little by little. So you got to learn how to praise him for the things that it seems insignificant to others, but it's significant to you. The fact he woke you up this morning, that may be insignificant to others, but it should be significant to you. The fact that you're in your right mind after all that you've been through, should be a reason to stop and say now listen you can look at me because you moved in the suburbs remember a hurricane can wipe that all out that's why he said i don't care if you're in an apartment whenever you think about me you need to stop oh you know hey pastor i'm a graduate of rollins college uh, we don't get down like that uh yeah but when you're in the hospital bed and you were told that you got cancer i bet you'll praise him then I bet if you're sick and don't know how you're going to come out, I bet your education will go out the window. I bet your Mercedes driving, S5 riding will forget about all of that because the heavens declare.
that God is good. And the rocks will declare, whenever God does something for you, not emotionalism. Some of them, well, that's a, you know, that's a, this was in my class. You know, it's, it's, it's a lot of emotionalism that happens in the local church, the local African American church context. And I sit there and I say, well, there's a lot of emotionalism that happens at a sports game, but that's not a problem. There's a lot of emotionalism that happens at a concert. That's not a problem. There's a lot of emotionalism that happens at a wedding day. That's not a problem. Because when you realize what God has been to you, it should touch your emotions. Because worship is a part of emotion. Because when I think about the goodness of oh my God, and all that he's done for me, my soul. I don't need a choir. I don't need a praise team. I don't need anybody. I just need my memory. I remember when I was by myself and the Lord made a way. I remember when I was going to give up and the Lord made a way. I don't need a cheerleader. I got a memory that helps me remember. Because he's been good. I'm thanking him because he's going to be good. I'm thanking him because of the times that I didn't realize he was good, he was still being good. That's an important keystone that, that y'all understand that as you launch a church, some people pray that it, it, some people are praying for the church, but they're praying it don't grow. And it's important to address what's okay for you when we're praying for it to grow. Because some people's level of growth is different than yours, and that doesn't make them bad. It's just different. And that will help you because some people say, Pastor, I'm with you until you get to 100 people. After 100, I can't take it. It's too big. That doesn't make them bad. That just means you need to set your expectations up front so that they're, you're not disappointed when they walk away and then you make them feel like they're the devil for leaving. That's because I've been in the desert and I know that. Don't make them bad. It just makes them, it's just not my style. We're setting up red chairs and trying to make happen what we thought could happen. God takes a dream and expands it. You can't forget. It's, it's not about what you have. I, I've been telling the church since July, I've been Ubering. Gene, Gene told me like, by, by two weeks you're done. My wife even said, there ain't no way you're going to keep Ubering. There's no way. I Ubered the church this morning, believe it or not, right? So my wife was like, no, I was like, no, we're just, we just going to ride this one car thing, and we're going we're gonna to be disciplined. We're going to be disciplined. My wife's like, I give you, I give you two weeks, tops. You ain't going to get up every morning, take me every day. I'm gonna take. My dad leaned over to me the other day. He said, son, everything okay? I said, yeah, everything's good, dad. He said, son, you still got one car. I said, yeah. He said, um, you struggling? I said, Dad, I'm good. I promise, Dad, I'm good. He said, okay. But here's the thing. Even being able to Uber, I was like, there's a reason to praise God. But you got the money to pay. And you understand what I'm saying? Like, it's not about what you can buy. Sometimes it's about the discipline that you have to not do what you can do. Some of you want to look rich and be broke. All right, you fly. All right, you fly. Right, but you broke. Right. It's, it's discipline. It's the joy of being able to say, listen. 
for me, Ubering, when we got one call, let me tell you this, and I was teaching this for our church, our church to show you like, listen, your success is not based on what you drive. That, that's what I was trying to get you to understand. Your success is not based on what you drive. It's not based, it's, liabilities are not what we rejoice over. Okay. Um, and I was teaching my kids something that I thought was very important that you need to learn to have discipline so you don't let your desires move you from the promised land into the desert. Because some of you are in the promised land, but because your urges, your urges made you go right back into the desert because you don't have discipline in the desert. It's about, don't, don't, let, don't let nobody toot their nose at you. Discipline. I want to free some of you because some of you feel like you're, you're in that jitty stage. You feel like you got to do something because everybody else around you is doing something. Stand still. Stand still. I don't care how many people post, I just started my business. Don't you quit your job. Stand still. Don't let the activity around you cause you to jump out of the promised land. You in the promised land. Don't try to impress everybody by going backwards. S Discipline. I teach my kids, I get a check, I show them it. And they say, Daddy, what are we going to spend? Nothing. want to teach them lessons in the desert so when they get in the promised land they'll remember the lessons we're so busy trying to be in the promised land that we never appreciate the desert stay there it's working for you it's work I, I promise you I, I swear to you with my heart before God the greatest seasons of my days maybe not while I was in it but it was in the desert and I went to Yale Princeton, University of Phoenix I went to all of these schools and none of them have taught me more in the desert feel good. It's not good. But if you stay there long enough, it'll pay you well. So if you're in the desert, it's cool. It's cool. It's cool. It's all right. You ain't in the promised land yet. This ain't your season to talk about the promised land. It's cool, but what you're learning is going to be game changer. But be patient. You will not win overnight, but you will win little by little. Don't worry about it. Whatever God needs for you to have, He'll find a way to get it to you. Guys, I'm telling you, when you have references in your phone and you can call anybody you want, you could start being dependent upon that. That's not what got you that. God did. And to you young go-getters, grinders, and ballers, shot callers, things to get people's attention. If you use that same effort to get God's face, you'll get God's favor. Get God's favor. You don't, you don't have to tag people to be noticed. God will favor you. Trust
trust me and believe. It may not happen when you want it to happen. But God will shake the scene. He'll make sure that you get where you're supposed to be if you devote yourself to him in the desert. I don't care if your marriage is in the desert right now. It's a pastor, it's a pastor, it's a bad space. Guys, what makes a diamond beautiful it's got to go through stuff. It's got to go through pressure. It's got to be cut. It's got to be hammered so you could wear it sparkling. Go through the desert. You don't see a 50 couple that's been married 50 years. They've been through the desert. Go through the desert. You'll get to the promised land. If you go through the desert, bow your hands up. Father, I thank you for the word of the Lord. I pray that you help us to have devotion in the desert.